Hey, and welcome to Coastal Community Church Online Service. We are glad that you are joining us. My name is Jeff, and I'm the youth pastor here, and we would love to connect with you. If this, if this is one of your first times joining us, uh, the easiest way to do that is to go to our website, discovercoastal.org, or you can go on our app uh, at Discover Coastal and fill out a Connect card. And also, if you have any prayer requests, that's a good place to fill those out so we can be praying with you as well. Uh, but thanks again for joining us, and let's go ahead and prepare our hearts for today's message. Well, if you have a Bible, uh, go and open up to the book of James. Uh, we're going to be in James chapter 3 this morning together. James 3. Uh, we're going to start in verse 13. I was hoping to get through more of chapter 4. We're going to bleed into chapter 4, but we're not going to get that far. We're going to stop at about verse 3. Um, but you can flip open to James chapter 3, starting in verse 13, 13 to 4, 3. And uh, as you're turning there, what we're going to see this morning in light of James is James is going to show us this contradiction between these two different types of wisdoms. And what we're going to see is that this, there's this one wisdom, which is this kind of heavenly wisdom, this true wisdom, if you will. And then as James begins to talk to us about that, he's also going to shine light on this false wisdom, this, this earthly wisdom. And as James shows us these two different wisdoms, what we're going to see is that what handicaps us the most from being able to fully embrace this true wisdom that James describes is essentially our pride. That pride is what hinders us from knowing God and enjoying God more than anything else. And the reality was that when it comes to pride, pride is that thing in us that we so quickly and easily ignore, and yet at the same time, the thing that frustrates us the most about other people, right? Rarely do we ever admit to our own pride because our pride is trying to get us to not admit to it, because if we were to admit to it, that would be humility and not pride, right? And so pride is constantly pushing back on us saying that we don't have a pride issue because our pride is telling us that we don't have a pride issue. But yet when we look at the people in our lives and how they live and we see the pride in them, that is the thing that often most frustrates the most about other people, right? We are hypocrites so well, right? I mean, just think about athletes. When, when there's an amazing athlete, and that athlete is incredibly prideful in who they are, for many of us, it almost ruins them, right? It's like, man, I want to root for you, but you're just so prideful. Now I want you to lose. Like, we hate teams for that reason and players for that exact reason. And the reality is that every single one of us in this room faces the reality of pride. There is a sense of pride deep within us, and if it doesn't get uprooted out of us, we will never fully know and enjoy this God the way we are meant to fully know and enjoy this God. And so where we're going to talk about this morning is we're going to focus our attention on this reality of pride within us as James talks about these two contrasting views of wisdom. And what we're ultimately going to see this morning is this, that true wisdom is seen not in what we know, but in the humility of what we do. True wisdom is seen not in what we know, but in the humility of what we do. That's where we're going today, all right? That's my main idea. Actually, that's my only point. That's it, all right? If you're going to write anything down, that's the thing, okay? That's where we're headed because that's where James is going to shine light. As he talks about these two wisdoms, what we're going to see is that true wisdom is seen not in what we know, but in the humility of what we do. And so let's dive in, starting in verse 13 of chapter 3. It says this, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. The first thing that James does as he begins to highlight this true wisdom is he asks this question, right? He says, which among you is wise and understanding? Who of you has wisdom? That's the first thing that James does. He asks this question, who of you has wisdom? And then in order to shine light on who it is that actually does possess this wisdom, 
James gives us a test of sorts. And the test that James gives us is very similar to the test of faith that we saw last week, right? Remember last week what we saw is that when James says that faith without works is dead, he says that not because works are needed for salvation, but because works reveal true, authentic, saving faith, right? Works aren't needed for salvation. Works reveal a faith that actually saves, okay? And in, in the same way, what James does here is he shines light on an external reality of our lives to show an internal truth. And notice what it is that James shines light on. Better yet, notice what it is that James doesn't shine light on. He asks the question, who is wise among you? And we think that the next thing he's going to say is some sort of pop quiz, right? Because oftentimes in our mind, when we think of wisdom, we associate wisdom with knowledge, and rightfully so. And so when James asks the question, hey, who among you is wise, it wouldn't be a surprise for us if he were to say, all right, pop quiz. But he doesn't do that, does he? He doesn't say, all right, who's wise? Raise your hand. All right, um, if you have a train that leaves Boston at 2 p.m. traveling 75 miles an hour and another train in Houston, no, that's not where he goes. He doesn't target the intellect here he targets something external. And what is, the, what is it that he says? He says, if you are wise, then show me by your works. It's the same thing that he talks about when it comes to faith. He says, you have faith, show me by your works. And now here he says, who among you is wise? Show me by the way that you live. And this really shouldn't surprise us too much that James points at works and not intellect. And the reason why it shouldn't surprise us too much is because even though we associate wisdom with knowledge often, the reality is that wisdom goes a little bit further than just simply intellect and knowledge. You see, what wisdom does is wisdom takes knowledge and it applies it to our life. See, the, the core basic understanding of what wisdom is, is wisdom is simply, at its core, knowledge applied. Which is why, oftentimes, when we go seeking after wisdom, we are seeking after things that are pertaining to life. Rarely does anyone go seek after wisdom because they need help on a math homework assignment, right? No one says, hey, I could really use some wisdom here. How on earth do you solve for X, right? That's not how we go after wisdom. That's usually how we seek knowledge and intellect and understanding about things, but not when it comes to wisdom. Wisdom is usually uh, pursued in the matter of things that pertain to life. And so we seek counselors, we seek mentors, we seek wisdom in our dating relationships, in our singleness, in our marriage, we seek wisdom in our finances, we seek wisdom on how to manage our time better. That's how we often seek after wisdom, and we usually seek after wisdom from people who are far older than we are, because as the saying goes, wisdom typically comes with age, and the reason why is because you have lived more life. And from the more of life that you've lived, the more of wisdom you have hopefully accumulated over that period of that time. Because wisdom is knowledge applied. The opposite of that is also true. If wisdom is knowledge applied, then foolishness is knowledge ignored, okay? Foolishness is not simply a lack of knowledge. Because wisdom is not simply a surplus of knowledge. Foolishness is knowledge ignored. If one of my kids, especially one of my younger kids, takes a fork and decides to shove it in an outlet, it's going to shock them real bad. And two, it's going to be really hard for me to be really upset with them because they don't know any better, right? It's hard for me to blame them because they're just a two-year-old curious kid. In fact, if anyone in that scenario is going to have blame, it's going to be me for not having an outlet protector over the outlet. Which, by the way, we do. Okay, please don't call CPS. Our house is safe. It's fine. No one's shoving forks. This is, not, this, is a, this is a hypothetical situation that's going on here. This is not something that happened recently, okay? But if you, an adult, 
a grown human being comes over to my house, finds the nicest, most metallic fork you can find, and then proceeds to shove it in one of my outlets, I can most certainly call you a fool because you should know better. If you don't know better, now you know. Don't do it. It will electrocute you, okay? But I can't really put that blame on my kids because they don't really know any better. But if you were to come to my house and do the exact same thing, you most certainly will be to blame because you should know better. Foolishness is not a lack of knowledge. It is knowledge ignored, and wisdom is knowledge applied. And so what we see here is that when James talks about this wisdom, he points to works, and that really shouldn't surprise us because all works reveal wisdom. It doesn't matter what the wisdom is. Works is the evidence of all types of wisdom. And so it shouldn't really surprise us that James points externally to our works as some sort of revelation, indicator, proof of that wisdom. What should surprise us, however, is how James describes those works. Notice that in this verse, James describes these works by using the word meekness. That word meekness means humility. When James says, asks the question, who is wise among you, and then says, show me by your works, he also tells us in the meekness of that wisdom. It is in humility that this sense of true wisdom is authentically revealed. And so here's the question. If wisdom is knowledge applied, and if humility is the mark of this true wisdom, if, if humility reveals this sense of true wisdom, then what is the wisdom that James is talking about? The wisdom that James is talking about is, one, a wisdom that humbles us, and the reason why it humbles us is because this wisdom is a right understanding of who God is and a right understanding of who you are in light of him, because nothing will humble you more than seeing the greatness of God in light of your depravity. You see, we worship an amazing God. He is a holy God, a righteous God. There is no one like this God. There is all of creation, and God stands alone as the creator of all things. He, there is nothing and no one like him, absolutely nothing. To compare God with anything is heresy because he is like nothing. There is no one like him. He is greater than all, higher than all, supremely better than all. That is the God that we worship. And in light of who he is, there is no one more broken or depraved than we are. There is nothing in creation, except for maybe demons, that are more unworthy of getting to know God personally God is high and mighty, and at the opposite end of the spectrum, we are the lowest of the low. There is nothing in his creation that is more broken and more depraved than this God. And when you begin to, oh, sorry, than us, not this God. He is holy. We are depraved, right? And when you begin to realize the reality of this truth, it should produce within you a sense of humility. You cannot boast in the presence of a mighty God because you have nothing to boast in. And so when James talks about this wisdom, this is the kind of wisdom that James is talking about, a right understanding of who God is and a right understanding of who we are in light of his greatness. And the Old Testament agrees with James on here that this is the true essence of wisdom. Look at Proverbs 9, 10. It says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. 
That word fear, to fear the Lord, not only means this kind of uh, terrifying sense of fear because God is a righteous judge. There is that degree of it. But that word fear, more than anything, what it really references to is this sense of reverence and awe. It's seeing the greatness of God and being humbled by that greatness. That's what it means to fear the Lord. We see this pan out a lot of times when we meet uh, people in our lives that we see to be great. Like if you were to, to meet that celebrity crush that you've had forever or to meet that person that you really look up to, that hero in your field of work, whatever it might be, Oftentimes, when we meet those people in our lives, there's a sense of fear that rushes over us, not because they are terrifying people, but because their greatness shines light on our own insecurities. And so it becomes incredibly difficult for us to approach them, not because they are terrifying, but because they are so highly valued and esteemed. Their greatness shines light on our own weakness. The person who says this the best, I think, is Maui from the movie Moana. This is what Maui says. He says, I see what's happening here. You're face to face with greatness, and it's strange. You don't even know how you feel. It's adorable. Well, it's nice to see that humans never change, right? When we talk about fear, that's what we're talking about here. That when we're face to face with greatness, there's this strange feeling within us, this sense of fear, not because they are terrifying in and of themselves, but because their greatness shines light on our own insecurities. And so what we see in the Old Testament, what we see in James, is that true wisdom is a right understanding of who God is in, in light of a right understanding of who we are. Are. And when you see God that way and yourself that way, it is meant to produce within you genuine, authentic humility. And the reason why I say genuine humility is because there is such a thing as false humility, isn't there? See, false humility is this sense of I'm going to try to humble myself before others so that others will see that I am humble, right? That's false humility because what you're doing is you are trying to be seen by others just from a humble way. Let me give you an example of this. Self-depravity is, or sorry, self-deprecation is a sense of false humility. What self-deprecation does is it, is it tells everyone around us that we actually aren't as good as people are claiming that we really are, right? And what our hope is in the middle of that is we think that we're being humble because we're trying to shine light away from us and not receive all this praise and adoration and glory. But in reality, what happens is that it actually brings more and more attention to us. It's the photo negative of pride. That's what self-deprecation is. And so what pride is, is it's not looking at us to see, uh, we're not trying to receive all this attention from all these other people. Pride is not thinking about ourselves at all. And what self-deprecation does is it wants the attention. It just wants it in a negative way. And so self-deprecation is not humility. It's a distorted version of pride itself. C.S. Lewis says it like this. He says, true humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. That's true humility humility. And that is what this wisdom is meant to produce in us. This sense of not thinking about ourselves so much, but thinking more about the beauty of God and how we can help and love others. That's what this wisdom is meant to produce in us, but oftentimes it doesn't, does it? My guess is that for many of us in this room, that that definition of humility does not accurately describe the humility that we experience in our own lives. And so even though this wisdom is meant to produce this kind of humility in us, rarely do we see it actually take shape. And the reason why is because the greatest enemy of true wisdom is your own pride. The greatest enemy of wisdom is pride. Because what pride tells us is it tells us that we don't actually need God. That's what pride tells us. 
Pride tells us that we are enough without him. You see, pride is the thing in your life that every single one of us faces that will detour your relationship with God most. It is the thing that will handicap your relationship with God more than anything else in your life. Author and professor Jason Meyer says it like this. He says, what makes pride so singularly repulsive to God is the way that pride contends for supremacy with God himself. Other sins lead the sinner further away from God, but pride is particularly uh, heinous in that it attempts to elevate the sinner above God. What pride does is it not only puts us at opposition to God, but it tries to elevate us above God in a sense that we don't need God at all. We see this the most clearly when we look back at the very beginning of the Bible, in the book of Genesis. After God created everything that God created, it was all good and right and perfect. And God created humanity in his own likeness and in his own image and gave them one singular command. Do not eat from the tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Do whatever else you want. Don't eat from that tree. Because if you do, you will surely die. In other words, sin and death will reign over this earth if you eat from that tree. And as we come to know, they eventually ate from that tree. But the reason why they were deceived in eating from it from the beginning is because of a temptation of pride. Look at Genesis 3, 4 through 6. It says, But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight uh, to the eyes, and that the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruits and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. You see, the temptation that comes to Adam and Eve in the garden is the sense of pride. The sense of, hey, you don't need God. You can be like God. You can be better than God. You can be above God. You don't need him. What you need is to be wise. Chart your own course. That's what you need. You don't need to follow this God because you can be God yourself. What the serpent does is the serpent pokes at their pride to the point where they eventually give into temptation. And notice that as they do, sin floods in. All sin and death flood in after that moment. And the reason why is because pride at its core is the core of all of our sin. At the core of every single sin you commit is a heart of pride, a heart that is arrogant against God, a heart that does not believe that you actually need him, a heart that doesn't believe that he truly can satisfy the greatest longings of your heart. At the core of every sin is this heart of pride. St. Augustine, from the 3rd and 4th century, is uh, famously uh, credited for coining the Latin term homo incurvatus in C, which means humanity curved inward on itself. And for Augustine, what he believed, and what many other theologians believed following Augustine, is is that this sense of sin, at the core of sin, is this reality of pride, that we have taken love that is meant to be aimed at God and have turned it inward on ourselves? We love ourselves. It is a self-love, not a God love. And because of that self-love, because of that pride, it leads to all of these other sin. Sin flows out of this reality of pride within us. And not only does Augustine say that, but James says it as well. Look at verses 14 through 16. It says, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but, it, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Ooh. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exists, there will be disorder in every vile practice. Jealousy and selfish ambition are not fruits of humility. They are fruits of pride. They are signs and evidences of pride. And notice what James says. He says, where that is true in our lives, he says, 
disorder and every vile practice comes forth. Because at the core of our sin is a heart of pride. To make this point even more clear, James shows us in the beginning of chapter 4 what happens when we allow this pride to really take root in our lives and all the disorder that it creates. Look at the first three verses. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. The word passions is the Greek, in the Greek is the Greek word hedone. It's the same word that we get the English word hedonism. And what it means is this, it's this pleasure inside of us that longs to be satisfied. And so as we see in James, what we find is that at the core root of our sinfulness is this heart of pride. And this heart of pride produces in us all of this sin. Sin floods out of a heart of pride, a heart that says, I don't need you, God. At the same time, the opposite of that, when we do come to the Lord and humble ourselves before him, righteousness flows forward. Look at the last few verses of James 3, 17 and 18. Because the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by the person, by the one who makes peace. What we find is that when it comes to humility, humility before God brings about a floodgate of righteousness, whereas our pride hinders that reality and brings nothing but sin and disorder and every vile practice, which means that the thing inside of you that is hindering your relationship with God most is not your porn addiction. It is not your alcoholism. It is not the gossip. It is a heart of pride against God. The thing that hinders your relationship with God more than anything is a heart of pride. Which means that what we need to do most desperately is we need to attack our pride and fight against it. That's what we know most desperately need to do. The question now is how do we do it? How do we fight against this prideful tendency that dwells within every single one of us? Our first response might be, well, I just need to just be more humble. If I can just bear down and just be more humble, man, I'll I'll get there. But that's not the reality, okay? If true humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less, then what we need to do in order to think of ourself less is to think of something else more. And what it is that we need to think of more is not how we can better be humble. What we need to think more of is the beautiful reality of the humility of Jesus. You see, it's when we gaze upon the humility of Christ that it shines light within us and we see more perfectly how amazing this God is. And as we see that wisdom, it it, it leads us to humility. Remember, humility is the result of true wisdom. Humility doesn't, doesn't produce wisdom. It is the result of wisdom. And so what we need more than anything is we need to feed our hearts in such a way that we can see more of who this God really is and be amazed at who he is so that we can be humble internally. John MacArthur, pastor and author, says it like this. Pride is the supreme temptation from Satan because pride is at the heart of his own evil nature. Our only protection against pride and our only source of humility is a proper view of God. Pride is the sin of competing with God, and humility is the virtue of submitting to his supreme glory. 
You will not win the battle against pride by focusing on your own humility. You will win it when you focus on the humility of Christ because as you begin to realize just how humble and amazing this God really is, it will dwell within you and stir up within you a sense of humility in light of his goodness and greatness. Philippians chapter 2 says, Have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. See, we worship a God whose humility is like nothing we can ever possibly understand or fathom. See, God is high above us, right? He, he stands alone, right? He is holy like none other. He is high above us, and we are so low in comparison to who he is. But Jesus willingly steps out of heaven to come to the lowest of the lows. His humility is greater than anything else because he is higher than anything else and he stoops lower than anything else. There is no other humility like this humility. Puritan Richard Sibbs says it like this, None ever went so low as he, for he suffered the wrath of God and bore upon him the sins of us all. None ever went so low. And then, in another respect, his abasement or his humility was greatest because he descended from the highest top of glory and for him to be man, to be a servant, to be a curse, to suffer the wrath of God, to be the lowest of all, whence comes, whence comes it that Christ is a servant. It is from the wondrous love of God and the wondrous love of Christ to be so abased. It, is, it was wondrous love in God to give him to us to be so abased and the wondrous misery we were in that we could not otherwise be freed from. For such was the pride of man that he being man would exalt himself to be like God. God became man. He became a servant to expitiate the, our pride in Adam so that in, its, so that in its wondrous in the spring of it. There's no humility like this humility that we see in Jesus. And when we gaze upon him, man, it begins to reflect in our hearts and we begin to see who we are in light of him. We begin to see our pride and our arrogance towards God, this Christ who willingly left heaven and stooped so low to be with us. And so what we need more than anything else in our life, if we're gonna face and battle this reality of pride in us, is not to try to somehow conjure up a sense of humility, but to simply meditate and reflect on the goodness and the greatness of God so that we begin to see him more rightly and in turn be humbled by what it is that we see. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, God, you are so good. And God, there's no one like you. God, you have stooped so low to be with us. God, you are high above all. And God, we are lower than all, and yet, Christ, you stepped out of your throne in heaven and came down to be with us so that we might know you and enjoy you forever. God, I pray that we see the reality of who you are. God, that we would humbly come before you and submit ourselves before you because, God, there is no one like us, like you. Forgive us, God, of our pride and our arrogance towards you. You're so good, so loving, so kind. I pray, God, that we would seek to know you, Lord, more and more and more. 
We love you, Jesus. Praise your name. Amen. Well, we hope that you were both encouraged and challenged by today's message. Uh, thanks again for joining us. If you would like to give, you can either go to our app, Discover Coastal, or to our website, discovercoastal.org uh, slash give, and you can give there. We thank you uh, so much for your generosity. Uh, well, thanks again for joining us, and we hope you have a great week.